I'd also like to thank Sabi again for the invitation to moderate and be in conversation with a truly wonderful set of practitioners as part of our next panel, uh, panel number three, which is on artist publications and platforms. Um, the, just to, to, to introduce the idea that we're trying to helm over here, the form of the artist publication as a shifting, changing site has, has grown to occupy space um, as a modality for artistic practice to exist and be expressed within. And uh, platforms for publishing, foregrounding these forms, these formats and processes have risen to the occasion in very, very interesting ways and have pushed the boundaries of representation moving towards multiplicities uh, that seem to reside in the very powerful act of something taking shape. Um, this panel brings together uh, speakers from a variety of backgrounds, uh, locales and contexts, and I'm excited to listen in to the kinds of practices of storytelling, critique and inquiry uh, intersecting here today. I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce my peers uh, representing Offset Projects, Reliable Copy, Blue Jackal and Restricted Fixations. Uh, founded in 2018, Offset Projects works to create channels of engagement in photography and bookmaking through artist talks, workshops, residencies, curated reading rooms, and collaborative exercises in publishing. And uh, the Offset Bookshop is India's only photo bookstore focused on independent and self-published books from South Asia. Uh, present as part of this panel, photographer, curator, and founder, Anshika Varma pursues the afterlives of images and the accessibility of visual languages using the photograph in conversations outside of her community related to storytelling, identity, and history. Uh, Reliable Copy is a publishing house and a curatorial practice dedicated to the realization and circulation of works, projects, and writing by and around artists. Based in Bangalore, they publish books and documents, curate exhibitions, undertake research projects, organize workshops, and host a wide, wide variety of programming. Editor Sarasi Jasubramanian is keen to overturn the common understanding of publications as final destinations of sorts, looking instead at the book as a document, seeking its own distinct form and activations. Creating and publishing visual narratives, comics, books, uh, picture books and initiating dialogue and learning within these contexts through interactive programs, Blue Jackal was born in, two, in 2015 of a desire for and the ever receding possibility of togetherness. Artist and illustrator Shivangi Singh as part of Blue Jackal finds inspiration in responding to the moment asking, how are stories told and who is telling them? Restricted Fixations is a subscription-based zine initiative each issue has a, has a different theme with eight issues in total and involves usually 15 to 20 contributors per issue with a broad range of mediums and sensibilities. The series was conceived as a response to the overwhelming move online since COVID-19 in 2020 and to activate something tangible uh, involving many contributors, collaborations um, in order to work with the present constraints using the mediums of zines and post. Renu Karaji, presenting today, is an artist based in Bangalore whose work inhabits a space that accommodates the imaginative, the observational, and the autobiographical. For any further information on our speakers, I'd invite our viewer listeners to visit uh, the India Art Fair website, and please do use the chat box and Q&A box for any questions you might have. Um, so as a, to, to, to begin with the structure of the panel as a reflective exercise, um, all of us invited each, uh, each other to frame in, in a quick five minute presentation, the impulse, the propensities and processes that ground our practices within and around the question of publishing. Um, as the programs manager for the Foundation for Indian Contemporary Art in Delhi, my work establishes frameworks and activates resources around art and education, curating research and public programming. And to kickstart this relay um, that we hope briefly brings to light the discursive positions coming together in this panel on artist publications and platforms, I'd like to share the ways in which FICA looks at what it means to both publish and platform. I'm just going to share my screen.
To begin with the basics, um, the space of the Fika Reading Room makes a large uh, and growing, has a large and growing collection of publications on visual culture and art history. And it makes it available to a public that includes art students, independent researchers, and art enthusiasts who have little or no access to university or private libraries in India. The Reading Room is actually an anchor for Fika, an art space open to the community at large, fostering ideas of ideas, exchanges, learning, and collaboration. And the room in itself um, is not solely defined by its capacity as a repository, but is also defined or, or activated by its many iterations and possibilities that extend beyond the specificities of this space, often activated by our readers, visitors, and by our efforts as an organization to intervene with and within the act of reading through our programs. We, in, in, in trying to think of what is it that we publish? Um, if we view the lens of publishing as something shedding light on the present moment, helming the collective, interrogating what it means to facilitate convergences and gatherings, conversations and peer networks, I'd like to think of what the participatory has come to mean within infrastructures and systems of support. Uh, what does it mean to create environments that foster learning through sharing? Um, and through our practice-based courses and workshops at FICA, we've been able to think about the dimensions of the concept of participation, particularly so as they become affective scaffolding for practices of art, of writing, of making and thinking to grow, reflecting the reverberations of co-making. Um, the, the, uh, to, to think further about the, the idea of the collaborative. Proceeding along a tangent not necessarily divergent in its conceptual texture, the formative role of the collaborative becomes something we can sit with and unpack, uh, be it the specificities of, like I mentioned, peer networks, the extension and expansion of resources for education, the coming together of like-minded individuals, institutions, and organizations. The collaborative, I feel, with FICA becomes a route to relationships. Um, to critical solidarities and familiarities that develop, sustain, and promote a widening of that which is at stake, the community. Highlighted here in this slide are two examples. Um, one was a workshop on art writing co-organized with Asia Art Archive in India that brought together a range of uh, writing practices from the region of South Asia. And the second is uh, FICA's long-standing association, uh, a glimpse from FICA's long-standing association with the Students Biennale, uh, organized in collaboration with Kochi Biennale Foundation. The Students Biennale reaches out, uh, is a space and a platform that reaches out to government art colleges across the country and is invested in using the charge and the possibilities of a temporary global Biennale platform to energize the space of art schools today and art, pro art production across the country. To, to further this, this relay that we have started, I'd now like to hand this over to Anshika, uh, who will be speaking on behalf of Offset Projects. Thank you for that uh, introduction uh, and to the team, Sharpa and Ida. So, uh, I just want to check, can you guys hear me clearly? Okay, great. So I'm going to get into it. It's, it's an interesting time to speaking about publishing. Uh, specifically specifically photo book publishing today, while mainstream formats that have previously existed for photography seem to be shrinking immensely. Uh, as a photographer, I initially assumed the photo book to be a consolidation of an artist's journey, um, a testament, if you will, of works done, moments witnessed, and journeys undertaken. The true power of kind of holding this object in hand and allowing for the image to gain a life and experience of its own was revealed to me by diverse groups of children, actually, while I was conducting art therapy workshops in Delhi. The book became the beginning of conversations, and there was in my mind, began to kind of merge as we would pour over sequences, narrations, and, and often fantasies that the book would allow us to create. For that moment, these children owned the stories that photography allowed us to see. And I thought, how different the life of the image could be if, as artists, as curators, we could create a larger world for the images we make. Uh, it's 
you know, something similar to when I think about how tragic would it be if writers only wrote for other writers and were read only by other writers. In many ways, my experiences during these workshops have shaped and guided the creation of Fuckset projects as well. I wanted to have conversations on photography with those who existed outside of that world. Our library, the Pitara, was conceptualized as an open moving space so people could have small encounters with books relating to satire, humor, observation, history, sociology, storytelling, a range of formats. It was also here that I made conscious choices into the inclusion of what we refer to as the artist book. Um, very few publications allowed me to understand the book as a medium in its own right. And I've had a big impact in how I now address the act of reading and looking at imagery. The Pitara started a journey of library periods in schools, universities, community centers, and has also ensured that our engagement with offset, at Offset has a deep relationship in education as well. It was the transformative power of the book that I felt could create unexpected relationships between the photograph and its reader. The Pitara then became not just a site of reading, but also a site of responding. And created segments at each library, asking readers to send a postcard to characters, to moments, to objects from the books that they'd read. This was also the first rendition of the Guftugu program that later emerged during the pandemic. Uh, Guftugu found its roots in the desire for critical engagement and discussion with practitioners of lens and book-based media. Both creative mediums have undergone massive changes in access and form, especially over the last decade. Independent practitioners today uh, have also allowed for interdisciplinary ideas to be woven together through the book in their practice. However, awareness about these works is through extremely limited circles. And through Goof to Goo, I wanted to create programs and publishing experiments that allow for artists to engage with the book language using workshops, uh, mentoring programs, and editing, understanding elements of the medium, and, and so on. The focus of these engagements was to expand our association with photography, not just through established names of the photographic West, um, but also to create our own circles of solidarity and learning and create a stronger voice of representation of South Asia. For critical engagements within photography and the book, it was important for me to create a space for open-ended conversations to build a sustainable dialogue over time. So 2020, while we were all inside the four walls of our home, uh, the program took the shape of online conversations with artists from the region to give a sense of the concerns, processes, and directions that their work was taking in our contemporary time. Despite this virtual publication, if one may call it so, I was still interested in sharing the work through a slightly more open to interpretation format. And with the help of some funds uh, of, uh, by Pro Helvetia, we came into our first publication, also titled Gufta Guru. In the creation of this book, we wanted to make something that recognized the individuality of each author's voice and work. And this led to us making a deconstructed book comprising of 10 authors and nine chapters, each represented as a zine and constructed based on the concerns of the work and its author. We decided that the first print run of this book would not be available for sale, but instead, uh, uh, distributed it to schools, universities, and libraries spread across the country for no cost. Over last year, there was some concern that it have on making an English photo book. Um, primarily because for, for some of our authors, English was not language of comfort. And so we went back to the drawing board, the editing board, to create an offset edition of the book, which is now multilingual and addresses some more aspects of the author's work and the book form which earlier financial constraints were not able to support. In many ways, uh, each new journey that we've undertaken at Offset has been an organic process of listening to and conversing through photography with artists and audiences to see how we can make the language of the photograph, uh, one that is used largely today, also be a language that is understood universally. Thank you for that, Anna. I hope I made it on time. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Anshika. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Sarasija to go next. 
Hi, Anna. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'll be that on time because that was nearly like exactly, exactly five minutes, which is really impressive. Um, so I just wanted to start by also talking about how the two panels that I've already attended today, the ones that happened before, I'm also aware of how much information has been shared in such a short window of time. So I'm going to try and keep this brief and then um, I'll put in the links and then you'll be able to maybe um, see a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> so in the way that we kind of decided the panel, I think Annalisa has already introduced uh, reliable copy at its core and the kind of larger ideas that we've been working with. So um, like she said, we're a fairly new project and um, we started in 2018, we started operations in 2019. And um, we're a publishing house that focuses on uh, pu publications, curatorial practice, and looking at how works projects and artists, uh, works projects and writing by artists and around artists can be circulated. Um, this is the current version of our bio because we're also editors and we're constantly editing our own bio. So maybe it'll change a little bit in the days to come. Um, we're based out of Bangalore and um, the, core mem the core team started with two people, Nihal and me, and now we have a third member who is Tuti Bhavsar. And um, talking about the origin story of Reliable Copy is a bit tricky for me because I think I have to give Nihal full credit for the idea itself because it's something that <clears throat> I maybe joined in after he had already um, looked at the fact that publishing and publications was something that he wanted to bring into the sphere of art, specifically in the subcontinent, because this has been historically done in many ways in many other parts of the world and historically done in our country as well, uh, particularly regionally. But when we started operations and we started kind of developing our own focus and our own understanding of how we wanted to deal with this, um, the idea of defining publishing as a way of making information public really stuck with me. And so in that sense, distribution and circulation became very, very important parts of how we've been looking at publishing so far. And that again, in a very big way, like Anshika mentioned before, became as kind of a modality to be able to interact with the audience and to be able to expand the definition of what an audience is for an artwork. On the other hand, um, and a kind of a personal direction to the entire project is also that Nihal and I are ourselves artists. So like you see in the image right now, that's Mochu, Mario and Ravi, um, artists who we have published with or will be publishing with soon. And the project became a very important way for us to attempt to engage with artists, other artist practices very, very closely. Um, we wanted to be involved in every single step and we are obsessively involved in every single step of every project. So it's slower than um, how maybe commercial publishing works because of that reason. But the hope was that we can bring in these learnings into our own studio practice and uh, use these engagements to be able to um, figure out how we ourselves as practitioners are positioning our own practices within um, the art world in the country, subcontinent world, et cetera. Um, that's why this image kind of became a very strange documentation of a serendipitous moment because these are three artists based technically in three different countries. So the fact that they're in the same country, let alone the same city on the same night was an interesting uh, moment for us. Um, in terms of infrastructure, and I think there'll be an image in a while that will show where we work out of. Uh, this is a manuscript of, a very early manuscript of Ravi's book, which was bilingual, which he hand wrote in Canada, and then we slowly took it to the shape that Flexing Muscles is now. But in terms of infrastructure, we work out of our respective living rooms, actually. And um, even though it's a very, very small core team, every project brings in a very wide range of collaborators. Sometimes it overlaps, but often the collaborators are very specific to the project itself. Because especially until now, and I'm assuming in the near future, our projects are quite diverse, like they don't have a specific idea, thematic, or even form that they occupy. So that's an image of Nihal's living room, which is um, pretty much our office space. 
most of the time. Um, in terms of collaborators, if I really go into a list, then I think this will be a wormhole. So I'm going to let that be and conclude by just talking about what publishing is for us and uh, bring back that point, because that's something that I've been thinking of a lot in all the conversations that I've been having either individually or collectively with the panelists, is that even though we're brought together in this panel, I think all of us define publishing very differently. And it is actually, there are a lot of overlaps, but the drive sometimes there are a lot of divergences in how we've been looking at it. Um, so for us, the idea was to look at the book as the primary object. This is something that Sabi mentioned also before. And um, it is to be able to say that the, publish the publication, be it a book or a website or a folder online, is not an accompaniment to an artwork or an idea, but it is the artwork or the idea itself. And that kind of helps us even work with practitioners and try and narrow down what it is that they want to do by constantly asking the question of if a publication is the best way to do it, and why is it that a publication and that way of mass publishing and mass production and mass circulation is so important to that project uh, as opposed to other media and other forms. Um, that's about it. It's just that I noticed that in previous panels, we were running out of time before we addressed questions. So just in case anyone has more specific questions, they can also um, write to us later and then maybe we can take those conversations forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sarasita. Um, Shivangi, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone um, for inviting Blue Jackal to this panel. Um, I'm just going to start with an introduction. Uh, we are an independent publishing platform um, that publishes visual narratives uh, such as comics, picture books, zines, visual poetry on our website, bluejackal.net and in print. So Blue Jackal is run by three core team members, myself, uh, Shefali Jain and Lokesh Khurke. And recently we've been joined by artist Sharvari Deshpande. Um, so I'm going to think through three questions that we have been thinking through uh, while we conceptualized what Blue Jackal will be. Uh, and it's still crucial to us and how we function today. Uh, the first question is what were the stories or uh, what are the stories that we want to tell or publish? And um, the second question is, uh, how would you facilitate the telling of these stories? And the third question is, uh, where would you showcase or platform these stories that you want to tell? So um, to answer the very first question of what kind of stories, uh, we are interested in telling stories that respond to our immediate social and political realities stories that speak of particular contexts and come from diverse locations. And then we are interested in retelling of stories of folklore for the current moment. To answer the second question of how we facilitate the telling of these stories. The first way, the second slide. <laughs> the first way uh, is to put out open calls. For example, in a series called Situation Comics, uh, where we invite single page comics uh, based on a particular prompt. So our very first prompt uh, or situation was a one page comic uh, where we brought in an excerpt from the last note written by Dalit scholar Rohit Temila. And uh, that quote inspired many artists to then respond in the form of their own single page comics and then speak to the questions that this note had invoked. Um, secondly, we also uh, invite specific artists or illustrators to make work or showcase work uh, that they've already made with us on our website or otherwise. So for example, uh, our web comic, The Summer of Maximum Learning by Shumana Das, which we heavily edited with her, um, is uh, set against the drop, uh, backdrop of uh, Shaheen Bagh protests and the first COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, the third way of facilitating these stories uh, or the telling of these stories is by bringing artists together in a common space, like a workshop. Uh, so, and then also to engage with a specific theme. So for example, in 2019, we held a 
series of three workshops with a focus on thinking about childhood as a site. The responses of the artists uh, that are in this workshop have then been collected in a publication uh, that we are bringing out soon. And the third question that we grapple with uh, is the question of where would we showcase and platform these stories. I think that's where Blue Jackal comes in. Um, when we started out, we began with open calls and we used to publish the entries we received on our website. So basically the website is the one space we work out of the most. Uh, and we did not have any funding, so it made complete sense to uh, do this online. And uh, also we were very curious to see what will happen online, what kind of things will be provoked online uh, through these web comics that we were putting out. Um, and over time we have realized that it's not just about finding some space, but also co-creating platforms for dialogue, for display and for distribution of our independently published material. Uh, one of these is a volunteer driven festival for independent comic makers uh, called the Indie Comics Festival. Uh, the need for these spaces comes from the fact that many of us and our friends or collaborators have found it difficult to publish the work that we do, sometimes because of censorship and sometimes because of the funding. Uh, and as we know, many mainstream display and distribution platforms, such as art fairs, uh, galleries and museums, have pulled down voices of dissent and critique. So it then becomes essential for us uh, to, as creators to co-create these spaces uh, where we're able to share these works, where we're able to uh, talk to each other in a community without the fear of being censored and with minimal monetary investment. These spaces have also generated a sense of community and solidar solidarity among all of us who are independently doing this. Uh, while none of these methods are finite answers to these questions that I've raised, uh, we are constantly looking to expand uh, on them by engaging with newer formats, uh, newer processes of making things, and by engaging with different kinds of artists. And uh, with that, I would like to close my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Shivangi. Um, we have Renuka next uh, speaking about restricted fixations. Okay, maybe first thing I'll say is that uh, I think unlike the other projects, you know, this is a very uh, finite uh, sort of, you know, what do you say? It's going to be eight issues and then that's about it. So, you know, it's like, in a way, short project in the scheme of things. Um, so, I mean, I've been, I think mostly I've been working alone, you know, like I've been making zines sporadically, I guess, over like 10 years or something, like very on and off. And yeah, I didn't uh, expect to end up doing something like this because it started off as this, you know, casual conversation, which then became... Um, you know, once you start asking people to kind of you invite people to contribute, you know, then it's on. But then the collaboration kind of quickly fell, uh, fell apart. Uh, but I guess for some reason I thought, okay, let's give it a shot. Um, so yeah, then it, uh, so I mean, this image here is the upcoming issue, which I guess I've been sitting on for now, I think what, it's I think almost four months, <laughs> three months or something. So yeah, aim is to bring it out this month and then I think there's one more and I'll be done. But uh, so, I mean, the whole thing, it's like quite a home operation, you know, it's a small, it's a very small thing also, like, uh, uh, what would I say, like, it's, so I think some of the aspects kind of come from the initial conversation also, you know, like to have it a subscription based and, you know, to have like eight issues and all that, so. Stuck with those things also because it felt like it would be an interesting experience also just to see you know, how this how this works also because uh, I had my own personal kicks with you know making parcels and posting them and all that but I think now I'm yeah beginning to detest the post office but um, what is it like. Um, so I think there's about what, like almost 60 subscribers now. I think it started off with like about 30 or something. A lot of it was, you know, just through writing to people and saying, hey, you know, do you think you'd like to uh, give it a shot, subscribe to this project and see what, 
let's you know see how it turns out because there is no real uh, clarity in that sense and i think all the sort of uh, it's been like issue by issue kind of planning except for you know maybe uh, inviting people and things um so yeah i think contributors also i think it largely began with personal networks i think it's also largely remained that way but it started with kind of feeling like okay uh do i know enough people to you know actively bugging a whole bunch of people you know whether i knew them or not to like you know meet someone and feel like oh can figure out a way to bug them and you know bring them into it or something uh this image i wanted to add because you know this is by uh, sony ben who's the daughter in law of uh, teju ben who is you know an artist who worked with uh, tara books on one of their uh, screen printed books so i think this was also very random like i think a lot of nice things have happened randomly in this project you know because this is like during the covid time i think there was a kind of a whatsapp uh, uh what do you say Uh, like a sort of forwarded message you know saying okay like you know they are looking for commissions in that time you know so who would be interested in stuff and so i think these things kind of coincided and you know like at some point i was like hey you know maybe this can make it into the book so and this actually felt like some kind of an exciting turning point you know? i felt like okay you know this is sort of um, it also made it like i don't know it uh, expanded the kind of you know range of uh, practitioners also who are in it so i think that is also another thing i think most of the people who are contributing are all like not zine makers uh, mostly they have not made books so you know they some are like i mean the second book you know for example was uh, the cover was you know made by my brother's wife you know she was a lawyer at the time like and you know now is like a teacher and all that. but you know but i knew that she did watercolor so you know it was really just like uh, carpet bombing but in a personal way and also like seeing i mean because and in a fun way also you know just like uh, i find it fun i think to bug people who are you know like doing nice things but sometimes you know they're hiding it or they're not really uh, doing it that much because sometimes you need a uh, an occasion also i think plus i was having some trouble with my arms so i thought instead of making my own work i'll you know email all these other people all of that uh what else yeah so that's my bed so i think i all my work is basically a home operation i guess so this is also no different i think this must have been at some point where i was still enjoying making envelopes you know like i think by the fifth book i was starting to wear out it really felt like you know now this is feeling like tedious work because initially it felt like okay you know the fun part somebody you know receive something in the mail and you know it's uh, there's something to it you know something to the effort you know put into it but uh, yeah to be frank i'm i've maxed out this but uh, yeah so i guess yeah the whole thing is kind of a home operation except for the printing part you know which is also close by uh, this whole thing is happening in bangalore which is where i live um and it is sense yeah like I don't know what else to say. One second. Yeah, I haven't thought too much about publishing actually. To be very frank, you know, like I think it started like years ago with just uh, like uh, love for books, I guess, and it um, more like artist books. And then at some point, it felt like you know, oh, it would be nice to make something printed because you know it's reproducible. but i think it was always too intimidating to go for you know proper printing you know and sort of um, that whole thing i mean somehow i felt too uh, and then also to kind of you know lay things out digitally you know that again you know somehow i mean i had a blog i think now it's not there anymore because all uh, this series is happening pretty much uh, uh, what do you say like because i think people are sending work you know uh, files and things so i think all of it is laid out digitally but then printed uh, and then hand bound and all that but prior to that i guess i was working purely by hand and then you know photocopying and things like that so yeah it's more just that the form is very forgiving maybe that's my um, reason to stick with zines or also to enjoy them in a sense because even with this one you know i initially suddenly i was like oh shit you know the other people's work 
you know, I can't treat it like I treat mine because I'm fairly rough with my own work, you know. Some text is getting cut, uh, the edges are, you know. Like, I'm not too bothered because, you know, I feel somehow. But with other people's work, it felt a little bit like, oh, shit, better treat it differently. But that way, I felt like people were cool with it because they were like, ah, it's a scene, you know. So, if, uh, so what, you know, if the image in the center doesn't... Um, register properly or you know so it, i mean in that sense i like that it's a very forgiving format not to say that i'm trying to or no i mean actively i'm not to self i'm not trying to actively be you know negligent or something but uh, at the same time it does maybe partly because of the form itself it's been an enabling experience because i don't have any prior experience in you know, like laying stuff out and i mean it's still like work in progress on that level It'd be good to see once it's done, you know, give it some time and then see like, okay, is it decent? So, yeah. Thanks, Renuka. I think I'm, I'm back at trying to figure out how to stop sharing, uh, but... Uh, But uh, to, to now proceed into the second half of the panel in, in what we envisioned would be an opening up of the space uh, of discussion with propositions from, from me to all of you and from, from, the, from all of you to each other, and then to also open it up to the audience in case they have questions. Um, but to, to jump right in um, ac across your works, having been in conversation with you for uh, the last few days, there is there is a commonality that becomes evident, and and this is one of of addressing the kinds of definitions or categories that you all find your practices occupying or being occupied by, and and for instance, we have the idea of of genres and how they construe the spaces that certain publications or forms of publications can inhabit. Um, we also have the ways in which some of you position yourself alongside or within language and visuality, uh, where, you're, where you're trying very hard to, to gear yourself towards ensuring plurality and, and an accessibility of all kinds to different kinds of audiences. So taking this line of thought forward, um, what are some of the operative vocabularies at play that you encounter in your practice and and how are shifts within these 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 words these definitions that we use um if any um contextualize in some format of uh, the present moment for publishing so i have been the designated open for all responses and i will follow through on that. Uh, I mean, it was really nice to actually listen to everybody because um, like Sarsita said, we're all, we're all dealing with printed matter, not published matter, let's just say, but what is the publication is so varied and, and there's so many positions that we come from. Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, for, for us, for, uh, I think, the largest concern that's kind of guided us through is is dissemination you know you have the medium of what you're creating it's so critical to kind of do justice to it and and uh, i was listening to renika talk and i was kind of connecting with so much of because you know the gustu book is the, actually literally the first book that we did um i had never made i mean i i've made some dummies before but i I'm not a designer. I don't know how to lay out pages. I don't know how to print properly. And you're dealing with other people's works, right? So I think what becomes really important in a project like Goftugu is that you are kind of taking the responsibility of an author's work, you know? And so you want to do right by it. You want to make sure that it has wide access. It can create conversations that, you know, the author's intended for the work to create. Um, since we're also talking photography, uh, uh, in some cases you want to do right by the image, uh, you know, 
Uh, otherwise, one could just view this work online. Why are we going into printed matter, especially today? And you know, um, so you want to do right by by the image. You want to you want people to understand that looking at the photograph is not necessarily just looking at uh, content, but it's also looking at the language of color. It's looking at the language of paper. And you know, you want to create a lot of awareness at the same time in like in this one object. And so. I think when you're editing someone else's work, the concerns are are immense on a responsibility front. Secondly, for us at Offset, it's very important to make sure that uh, conversations emerge out of it, that it's not the ending point of, of engagement. And which is why I think for us, before we would even we were able to think about like, how do we price it? How do we sell it? Which shops can it be at? Like our first concern was, can we give it for free? And if we can, then where can we offer it so that it has wider access even from that point onwards? So I think for us, uh, access is a big concern, access both in terms of accessing the book, but also accessing the language of the book. And, and many factors you know, come into play. Using the zines was actually a reason um, that did come from that, you know, because um, they, I mean, they do different uh, concerns, of course, but one is, of course, that I didn't want every artist's work to be kind of bound up into one template, right? So we wanted individual treatments, but also people are more forgiving to the zine, but also people are al allow themselves a lot more intimacy towards an informal, you know, language. And so we wanted that to be the first point of engagement as well. Um, I think a big concern that we realized, which we try to work on in the second issue, was also that of language. Uh, you know, because when you're talking about diversity, when you're talking about representing different languages, yes, photography is a language in itself, but, you know, there is kind of like this expectation of making photo books in English. I, I do not know where that came from. And... I realized it only because instinctively I had also done the same. And then I sat back and I remember I was talking to the artist and I said, okay, we've done this, but how about we use, you know, Tamil, we use Urdu, we use the language that you guys, uh, you know, speak in. And everybody was really surprised and they said, but it's a photo book, shouldn't it be in English? And, you know, and I was like, but who said that? You know, let's, if, if it should or if it shouldn't, we don't know. And so I think it's also, deconstructing what we've assumed for the book to become, uh, which is very important for us over here at Offset, yeah. Um, I think this is where most of the overlaps will turn up because I think some concerns like uh, circulation and dissemination and Renuka talking about being sick of the post office is very, very difficult for any of us to kind of counter and say that we don't feel the same. Um, but I'm going to try and take a slightly different direction because um, I think uh, Anshika has very clearly spoken about certain ideas. Um, but for us, like I mentioned before, this um, concept of the book and the, pub uh, the publication in general being primary to the idea or to the artwork has been a very, very important part of the way that we've been looking at the vocabulary of what publishing means within the art world specifically. So something that comes up, I think a lot has been the form of the book, um, the physicality of it, whether it's virtual or uh, a kind of material physicality, the form that it takes has become a very, very big part of our interaction amongst each other and with whichever the artist or the practitioner is that we're working with. So that has been, and hopefully it'll get wider and wider as time progresses, but that has been a very, very important driving source, a driving force in being able to understand how an outcome will exist in the world. And for that, I think the best example would be um, a relation between our first publication and our last, like, last publication, actually because the first publication that we did was online. It was a digital folder. It's copy left. It can be downloaded onto not just your laptop, but any device that you're using. It can be printed in any form. 
and it was by the artist Chinar Shah. She's also based in Bangalore, and it was called the Memorial for the New Economy. So, the fact that it was copy left, and the fact that it was a set of printable images that could be accessed by anybody, but also if you had access to it, you could produce it however you wanted to and circulate it however you wanted to. was so important to the fact that it was a memorial and a public memorial and to be able to memorialize such an event it had to take a certain form and that really really like it wasn't it was never it didn't start off as something that was a virtual publication it was supposed to be a book it was supposed to be a very very well printed book it was supposed to take the form of a very physical photo book but then that just kind of moved in a very different direction and that has happened repeatedly in every book that we have done after that like uh, flexing muscles for example was initially a lecture performance a uh, lecture or lecture performance sorry a lecture that ravi kashi gave multiple times in bangalore and that then became an essay a bilingual essay that became a book and um, it continued like in mario's as well it because his practice is so much with lecture performances the book is kind of like a printed presentation of sorts that he's giving and then the cookbook of course um has a very specific form of its own so i guess that understanding of how the outcome finally takes a certain form and why is it that takes that form and then who do we then collaborate with to get as close to that um end result as possible becomes a very important vocabulary i guess um yeah and i feel like there is that overlap very clearly right now with reliable copy um because uh, blue jackal also started with you know the web comic and um started with the format of online and then went into print in that sense and so we have had like a learning curve with all of that the process of it and for us i guess like coming back to what i was saying earlier like visual stories as as a as a thing that we wanted to concentrate on um, has been the the place where it comes from so uh, for us the fact that it can it can be a uh, a place that makes uh, stories more accessible just because they are visual is highly like important and uh, so how that the form of the comic or the form of the uh, visual narrative in that sense that we call it um is definitely like something that we find exciting because it, it it just doesn't uh, have a watertight uh, you know uh, category it, it goes from being uh, serious and goes to humorous it goes from being political and it has the form of the aesthetic and so for us that that whole thing of it being between fine art and pop art pop culture so i think that is something that we found very exciting and um, and find exciting and so then how currently especially in the present moment how uh, this form is contextualizing a lot of the protest sites is really exciting to us or how um, this form is able to talk about these stories is very exciting to us because i think uh, there is a lot of potential in in this format and uh, th- i think that's been the the kind of um, operative thing that we work with in that sense and that that form uh, that format shapes up what publishing is for us uh, i'd say my case um... low budget is definitely been you know like a what do you say main category low budget easy going fun all that but then uh, in a way i'll say like okay one and a half years ago when it began you know like pretty much uh, around the time the first wave was happening lockdown was happening and all that it uh, yeah maybe focus was on tactility because of, you know everything was moving uh, online and you know all of that and somewhere it felt like yeah, i was nice to work with you know something small something uh, reproducible and something which 
and dissemination more in the form of you know this analog kind of uh, postal service you know and i mean and india post is a great service i have to say <laughs> like uh, in that sense you know like regardless of the size of the reach it was also more about uh, materiality in that sense you know and i would say another thing is also like okay like on the one hand i guess in the last few years you know there's been a lot of like interest in zines but then i've also met a lot of people who feel terribly um unsure what the zine is or, you know and it's like i mean it's almost kind of like you know it uh, defeats the whole purpose of this uh, medium and to that extent it also because i think there's certain hang ups about you know like okay uh you see certain kinds of zines from certain kind of places or you know it's some people think it's got to be political some people think it's got to have you know certain aesthetic and so in that sense it also felt like okay it's a nice exercise to kind of you know have all kinds of sensibilities come in and you know kind of uh, swim around um yeah and just to have this something this happens also which you know hopefully can have a broad uh, visual sensibility within this kind of i guess yeah genre which is currently it's trending so. right thank you and i think like uh, some of you did sort of uh, touch upon the next proposition as well which is that in there there i was actually wondering how how the form of the publication because something that sarsija brought up and even uh, anshika did the that the form of the publication becomes something that is um creating convergences in terms of audience uh, thematics and subject matter and um eventually so often what we publish becomes a site for multiple acts of translation um between formats uh, uh with with reliable copy for instance moving from uh an interest in cookbooks to a curatorial in- experiment um not necessarily in linear fashion and um and also c- constellations that come in with kinds of uh between kinds of audiences and modes of dissemination so i was actually wondering if if any of you wanted to touch upon or reflect upon how uh how these forms of of publications and and their processes how they open up spaces of encounter for you so i'd actually like to respond to that from two positions uh if it's possible i mean one would be the position of of the publisher uh where the encounter is uh you know with gustavo the encounter that we were concerned with um were based out of currently we've only had the first version out uh we were scheduled to have the second version out this month but owing to pandemic scenarios we're not sure when that might happen but with the first um, version that did come out i mean you know the idea it was a very conscious decision that how it's engaged with is very specific it has to be in spaces where we're talking schools libraries um, institutions where people do come to read to give them access to a different kind of voice uh, and so for schools and universities we actually drew up a program and we facilitated that program with them to say how can the book then be part of con relations on gender how can the, you know i mean different issues that are addressed by different authors uh, so that is one aspect that uh, came in with the book the second aspect is kind of i mean it encounters a very central to what we do at offset pitara which is our mobile library and so over there the entire focus of the library has been to create spaces where uh the book becomes a facilitator for conversations that might be difficult to have otherwise uh you know and and one uh, one such scenario that immediately comes to mind is actually when uh, we had this pop up in chennai um and uh, we had a singaporean artist by the name of Sean Lee uh his book over a uh, part of our library uh, and the book is titled Shauna it's about 3 years of his life where he adopted the persona of uh, of a woman and he eventually kind of you know reached a point where personally he felt he had to choose between being shona or shon and although he decided to go forward being shon as he was he wanted to give an ode to shona and made a book for her 
and uh, and I, I remember there was a visitor at the library who was kind of poring over this. It's a very tiny, thin-ish novella, if if one may uh, say so. And she'd been sitting over it for hours, uh, you know, and uh, and I kind of just approached her and I said, "Is there anything I could help you with? Is everything okay?" Uh, and and she actually revealed to me at that particular point of time that that very morning her her child her son had um, told her that he felt that he was a woman in the body of a man and she did not know how to have this conversation with him and she decided to just come to you know a pop up and like kind of switch off from that moment and she was sitting here in this library and the first book she encountered was this. So, I mean, I feel like in terms of how, you know, how do we allow encounters to, to give an afterlife to, to the work that are created is, is very important to us at, at the library. It's important and it's very, uh, it really uh, defines how we choose to curate the different pop-ups, which city are we going into, what kind of students are we going to meet, um, what are the conversations that we would like for uh, people to have with photography? You know, we did a zine making workshop post uh, the CA protests in Jaipur uh, in 2020, where Renuka was also there at Art Book Depot. And, uh, you know, we did this zine making workshop where we just got newspapers from Jaipur uh, for a week, uh, a week long kind of pile of newspapers. And we just told people to sit through the pages, look at anything that kind of caught their attention and then create zines out of that. And so I think what was really interesting for me was by the end of that, once the workshop was over, I actually got messages much later from people saying, you know, we're actually now questioning the images that are in the newspapers because we want to know why they appear the way they have, why they are at the scale that they're at, why you know, why is there a certain kind of terminology that's coming with that? And so, I mean, we've, it's been very important for us to, to not make it kind of out there, but to allow for spaces that offer reflection. And, and then, you know, one can choose how they would like to engage with the work. So there's, there's two engagements that I wanted to address uh, for this particular. Thanks for that. Um, I can also actually think of a very clear demarcation between two engagements, but um, I don't know how to say this very shortly, so maybe I'll stick to one, because um, Annalisa also took the example of the fact that we did a kind of curatorial engagement after the cookbook launch and opened out the research and the process that had gone into it and also expanded the idea of cooking and food. Um, there is information about the show online for anyone who wants to know more. So I'm not going to get into the premise of the show itself, but just that because food as an idea was what the artists in the show or the books in the show were engaging with and looking at um, in extremely, extremely different ways. Um, there was no actual food in the show and it wasn't really about convening or eating or anything like that. But just because there was a little bit of this connecting thread that became so easy for a very, very wide audience to walk into, uh, for, for a very wide audience for walk, to walk into and engage with in some manner, um, we in the process realized that giving a curatorial walkthrough or talking about a book or talking about politics, gender, society, culture, everything, however dense and however... Um, complex the artwork is, in most cases, a contemporary work of art, it, we can pull it off because they have walked in because they're interested in the subject. And then after that, it's just about kind of telling a story and giving them the context of why such an idea is being positioned. So I guess it's, it's like, it's the same kind of duality where there is a publication and there's a publication enters bookshops and it enters homes and it enters pop-ups and it has, but then what kind of a life does it have? What kind, how many ways in which, how many ways can a publication be defined as? Um, can you look at it as, can an exhibition be a publication, for example, was the proposition that we were playing around with. And 
those kind of expansions help with at least help us with understanding audience engagement because like everyone else in the panelists said we're constantly looking at ways of distributing the publication itself but then there's so much else that then gets generated as discourse around it so um the only example that really comes to mind is that we had we had videos artworks and cookbooks we had some uh 14 cookbooks in the show and there was an artist who had come and she had seen the works and she had co- told her mother to come and her mother came and asked us can we can i spend can i come and spend 2 3 hours here every day and every day she'd come and spend 2 3 hours with one cookbook and very very diligently take notes and kind of she was only interested in vegetarian cooking so she would go through those books take notes and then go back and come the next day and look at the next book so it was just about recipe collection honestly at that point so i think in that sense it's interesting to have these moments and be able to then kind of archive these moments in your own head and hopefully generate them again the next time i think nehal has put a link in the general chat of the exhibition if anybody wants a little bit more information about it yeah i mean um, not going to repeat a few things that have already been said but uh, there are three things i guess which um, i would like to speak about uh, one is the whole like economy of publishing or printing the the whole uh, format that we work with and then um, i mean for us it was such a challenge that for the past 5 years only we have worked with black and white and this is the first time we are bringing out a color publication so i think that that whole process of understanding printing and interacting with the printer interacting with the designer these are our encounters that we really find valuable as well because it's like really um telling us what is the limitation or what is the challenging uh, challenges within within this um the second thing would be like this um the way we have um, interacted with the audience and uh, we have uh, so far been working a lot with uh, artists or illustrators that we um, know or have invited through open calls and then we've been in touch with them then there's a community that has uh, that has formed and um, through that we have had like these conversations with them and that has been one way so through that there's that whole like exchange of ideas which has been really productive for us and um, in that there is like so much possibility of thinking about you know uh, learning how to do web comics for example because uh, the format for a web comic is so different from the format of a print uh, printed book and uh, these are all like again like learning curves for us and then finally right now uh, on our current project which is uh, octa 2021 uh, two ones are two two rules are a long title it's um, it's basically about uh, childhood as a site and it came from the space of a workshop where we had invited 24 artists and illustrators to think about this thematic so i think when that happens that opens up a whole different way of thinking uh, the the togetherness of that space really opened up uh, you know that encounter for us and it then in turn to think about the audience became even more exciting because now you're thinking about the workshop space as a place where you can change uh, pretty much the idea you came in with and uh, your audience is not just the final book person uh, in that sense so audience is also like your um, you know your continuing um, peers who are working with you in that workshop so that's that was really exciting for us and um, also because we're thinking about childhood as a site does that necessarily mean we are working for you know producing books for children in that sense so no because um i think that is not an exercise we're undertaking still so i mean these are all spaces where we are thinking of what to do and how to push it um and again like the last bone that as an independent publisher you have to keep thinking about is funding for the book and so like i think for the first time in 2021 uh, we did like a whole like crowd funding exercise and went on keto put a book there we also had a grant for it which was really great uh, but 
that's why we are able to do a colored publication for the first time so i mean these are all things that we um at thinking about and i think lokesh has put in the uh, link for our um workshop and then this upcoming publication here you can see it i say okay my experience with this project it's been mainly on a personal level i mean yeah somehow i mean i keep saying it but that's actually largely what the project has been also you know it's been like a lot of uh, so i would say yeah it's a lot of these connections you know which have been possible also because there is this kind of uh, an initiative you know to then sort of approach uh, the people with um yeah and in a funny way it's been quite um, yeah because like on the one hand okay like you know the outcome is tactile but i think in these last two years i think i've also had my own share of isolation and on our isolation just like you know the number of people have dropped way in you know, the lower level so that way actually it felt you know on some very basic level you know this human contact also in a kind of creative context was quite um, crucial i would say and i mean I think the rest of it is happening a little slowly in the sense of you know convergence, divergence. Um, yeah. Thank you, and um, I think we're now like formally at the end of the first day, and um, I think it's been wonderful. Uh, I'm very grateful for these conversations and what they've further spawned in terms of inclinations and research inquiries and directions to take take up maybe later. um uh, i'm also going to thank our audience today uh, thank you all for your continued engagement uh, with all that we've had to say and for being such patient listeners um uh, before signing off i'd like to now hand this over uh, back to sabi ahmed uh, to conclude today's sessions but thank you all thank you anna thank you Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone, um, on this panel. Uh, very illuminating. Uh, I must say that I think time constraints really changed so much because at least all the preparatory meetings that we've had, there was just so many pressing questions that were also put forth. But I think some of these carry over time. But before I conclude, just a few announcements that we will start the symposium uh, the same time tomorrow. That's five p.m. India time, five fifteen p.m. Kathmandu time, four thirty p.m. Islamabad time, five thirty p.m. Dhaka time. We're going to have three panels all over again, just like today. Those panels are going to be around collectives, artist collectives, and the rise of artist collectives. They're going to be around certain artistic practices all over again, looking this time not at mediatic environments but at sites and infrastructures, and broadly looking at texts. in the text in the expand in an, in the expanded field not just looking at the legacies of art criticism but also various new expressivities and uh, mediums through which texts are disseminating now and how art writers uh, identify with this practice uh, we uh, will have the same link that you used today to sign in um, to access the symposium tomorrow uh this by no means is a is a round up of some of the ideas discussed but some of my takeaways um from all of the panels and some of the really fascinating points that i thought came up uh i'll just make it brief and i'll mention four of them number 1 that it seems like the sites of encountering art have expanded and it's not just talking about say the commodification of nfts of what a number or code you can acquire but really how can you redistribute an experience and idea of art across mediums across uh, modalities um and not be also bound between virtual and physical as the only thing there's so many different kinds of places where art is expected to be uh met with and a lot of these practices are doing that and kind of connected to that point is that you can sense a destabilizing 
of the idea of mediums and sites altogether. Whereas before you had painting, sculpture, installation, so-called new media and things like that. Uh, you can see something in, even in this panel where a lecture performance becomes a book. A book becomes an exhibition. An exhibition is not even an exhibition. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, dialogue with someone. So curating, art making, all of these are certainly multiplying or unfolding into, into formats, forms that, uh, that are much more inventive rather than taxonomically defined. And you can see the practitioners themselves occupying so many of those, uh, uh, those modes. A, a writer is a curator, artists are curators, curators are uh, finding all kinds of expressive means of creating platforms or creating publications. Um, so some of those points and then also I thought what was really interesting was that the, the practices that we, that we met with today and the practitioners as we heard them, you can see that there's a defying of the logic of scarcity rather than creating an exclusive art object that is only made by one person and that is only that only exists as a single entity in the world that can only be encountered in one or two places depending on who's acquired them or which museum it belongs to um, it's in additions it's just it's it's multiplied again so a lot of these practices seem to be defying the scarcity logic of art and lastly you can see that almost everyone is to use an older kind of terminology, figuring out ways of seizing the means of production itself and not um, uh, depending on someone uh, to enable them to become artists. To be an artist is to create the conditions to make art, not just to receive conditions uh, that institutions have uh, laid out necessarily. And so on that note, uh, I'm going to sign off today and thank everyone who's attended for your patience. Um, I hope we'll have you again tomorrow.